Telling the stories of entrepreneurs and how they overcame the struggles and challenges to get where they are today. This is Believe in the Entrepreneur with Joel Sandoval, CPA. Welcome to another episode of Believe in the Entrepreneur, and I'm super excited because I have my brother here from another mother, Alejandro Aguilar. Thanks for being on the show. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate being a guest, man. Yeah, of course. Uh, so for those that you know don't know Alejandro, he's uh, one of the top guys at PHP, and I've been following him on social media for a while as well. And you know, it's kind of cool to hear your story about where you started and where you are now. But for those that don't really know, why don't you just tell us about, you know, where you were at before and how you got to where you are today? Yeah. So uh, my mom and my dad are from Mexico, Michoacan, right? So for anybody out there from Michoacan. Nice. All right. So my parents are immigrants from Mexico, Michoacan. And, um, you know, it's funny because my dad, uh, he's a five foot four short little dark Mexican, right? So <laughs> it's funny because like people think like, hey, you know what? Like you have to be, look a certain way, be a certain way to succeed, you know? Yeah. My dad comes in, short little five foot four, little dark paisano. My mom is... You know, Spaniard looking, really beautiful, but she worked in the fields. Mm. And my dad, he came to to United States and he had one goal and one goal was for him to establish restaurants. Mm. And so he comes to this country. And, and I always go back to my history because people don't realize that psychologically, who you are as an adult, you were actually wired yep. from age four to 17 years old, psychologically. So whatever you saw from age four years old to age 17 it makes you an adult today and yep. the decisions you you make as far as even you know the goals you have the the life that you want to achieve uh you know the relationship who you marry how you raise your kids your culture your principles your system on on processing making decisions all are based from age four to 17 years old whatever you saw at that period is what wired you as an adult yep. now it doesn't mean you can't change it it just means that that's like your baseline on decision making right and so watching my father come to this country and he comes to this country with no papers, no English, you know, he, he doesn't speak um, English whatsoever. He's five foot something, short, little dark, uh, you know, <laughs> Mexican. And he's called, my dad used to tell me like, yeah, they used to call me wetback, mojado, beater, yeah. <laughs> you know, and, and my dad looks at it like a challenge. Like he loved it. Like, oh, I'm a wetback. Oh, I'm a beater. Well, I'm going to show you. Right. Mm -hmm. So a lot of people, you know, they, they allow that to define them. And my dad didn't. Mm. And so he, he comes and he. He first goes and he becomes uh like he starts working at a little liquor store, then he goes works at a dishwasher. And then from there he would clock out for work and then he would stay in the kitchen. And he would start getting there next to the to the to the cook preps. And they would be like, dude, what are you getting what are you doing? They say, Largate, go home. You know, and the manager would be like, Hey, you're off the clock, go home. He's like, For what? Mm -hmm. What am I gonna do at home? I'm a, you know, I'm not doing what am I doing? Watch TV? I came to win, <laughs> right? So so he comes and he's like, he's like right there with the cook prep. He's like, dude, leave me alone. Get out of my way. He's like, no, just teach me, teach me. Mm. So finally, after a while, him never leaving, the cook prep was like, fine, I'll teach you. Mm. So he starts learning from the cook prep. And then after he learned what the cook prep does, he would clock off for work. They gave him that position as a cook prep. Then he would stick around and be a cook. Mm. He's like, and they would tell him, dude, we're not going to pay you. Like the manager would tell him like, just cause you, you're staying long. We're not going to pay him. He's like, I don't need to get paid. I need, I just want to learn. Mm. So the, the cooks would be like, dude, just move out of the way. Get out of the way. He's like, no, like teach me how to cook. He's like, fine. Right. So they teach him how to cook. He becomes a, a professional chef. Yep. Then at the same restaurant, he now goes from being a cook, which this is unheard of, to going to being a bus boy. Mm. And, and he was to clock out for work. He's like, I just want to be a bus boy for all the time I'm not working. And the, you could just imagine the owner and the managers being confused. And this year, a restaurant <laughs> called El Torito. I don't know if anybody's Oh, ever yeah, heard. yeah. Yeah, that's where he started his journey. Mm. And so he's now in El Torito as a bus boy after he clocked out from being the cook. And the, the, the manager was so confused. They're like, what are you doing? You should go home. He's like, no, I refuse to go home. So he goes from being a busboy, then he went to being a waiter, then he went to go, goes to be the bartender, and eventually they offer him a position. Do you want to be the manager? He mm. says, no. Wow. Like, what do you mean? He's like, I don't come here to manage anybody's business. I came to run my business. So my dad will go to all these nice restaurants and take the menus. He's like, he's like, can I have a menu? Like, keep it? And they're like, no. He's like, fine. He'll go to the restroom and stick the menu in his pocket and keep it. <laughs> and he will get all the best plates. And he created a restaurant called El Jacalito. Mm. El Jacalito was the first in Kern County, mm -hmm. in Bakersfield, you know, Kern County. It's the first 
Mexican restaurant that a Mexican born in Mexico opened up. Mm. See, there was other Mexican restaurants, but there were always like people like us, like our parents are from Mexico. We're born here. We open up a restaurant, right. right? My dad was the original in Kern County to open up a Mexican restaurant who was an actual Mexican owner who was born in Mexico, un paisano. Wow. And he did it with no papers, bro. Wow. <laughs> so crazy that this little small little restaurant came out on Times Magazine. Right. Wow. And so, you know, my mom's a waitress. My mom goes from working in the fields, goes and be a waitress. And then my dad sees her. And obviously, whatever happened, you know, I was born. My older brother was born. Mm. And, um, you know, I never saw my dad. When I was a kid, my dad used to say, mijo, mijo. I'm like, yeah, dad. It's like, mijo, if I can come to this country with no papers and no English, short, paisano, y moreno, like me, if I can make it and I have no boss, you hear me somebody call, you hear me call somebody a boss? I'm like, he's like, no. I'm like, who's the boss, mijo? I'm like, you are dad. It was exactly, if I can do it, what can you do born and raised in this country with two paper, with two languages, y con papeles? What's your excuse? Mm. That was my wiring, bro, from age five years old wow. that I can remember to who I am today as an adult. Wow. So growing up my whole entire life, man, was like, if I had no papers, no English, five for four little George Ch Chaparro, Mexicano, Paisano, Moreno, <laughs> if I can do it, what's your excuse? I'm like, dad, chill, I'm five years old, right? But that, that, that was like, that was his reasoning. Yeah. You know, so then uh, growing up, man, I knew it. I knew I had to go and become successful. I knew it was, my dad used to always tell me like, mira que falta respeto. I'm like, what? It's like, look at these kids. Their parents leave their country, jump the border, come to America. They come to a language that they don't know. They come to a culture they don't understand. They come to live a, a life that they don't know. They leave their family. They leave their parents. They leave their brothers, their sisters, their land, their food, their culture. They come to America. They have children. And then the children do nothing to, to get, make themselves better. Yep. And then their parents get older and they won't even take care of their parents. How disrespectful is that? Mm. And I'm thinking to myself, like, damn. And see, the whole time, man, we used to go to Puerto Vallarta, Huatulco, Acapulco. Uh, where's your family from? Oh, Guadalajara, my parents. Yeah, my From my Jalisco? Dad, yep. Where's your mom from? Uh, Michoacán. Michoacán, there yeah. it is. That's why we get a lot more, right? <laughs> so then, so my dad would be like, mira, mijo. He goes, these people leave everything that they know, and they come build a better future. And they have kids, and the kids do nothing with that opportunity. That's the most disrespectful thing you can do. Mm-hmm. I used to see my dad when we used to go to these different like uh, parts of Mexico. He used to always take my grandma with him. My grandpa passed away when I was like 15, 16. But my grandma, she was an older lady. She died like at 97 years old. But she, my dad used to take her everywhere with us. Mm -hmm. We used to go to Huatulco, Acapulco, Oaxaca, you know, you name it. Uh, Puerto Vallarta, Manzanillo, Acapulco. We used to go to uh, Mexico, the where the pyramids are at. Wow. Um, La Ciudad de Mexico. We, we went to Guanajuato where the, Las Momias and, the, you know, the mummies are at, everything. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, so my dad always took it. My dad took care of my grandpa, bought him a ranch, built him a ranch, bought my grandma a three-story house in Mexico uh, by La Plaza. My dad did so much for his parents that I, I said, my responsibility, like the Bible says, honor your father and your mother mm. and your life will become successful, right? So my whole concept was of life. You better succeed because you have no excuses. Don't you dare and disrespect your parents by not doing something with the opportunity that's been given to you. Right. And you better take care of your parents and your father, and your mother, because that's the most honorable thing you can do. 100%. So- Yo, my, my upbringing was you better win because your parents are your responsibility, bro. And that was my biggest concept. But see, society screws us up a little bit. Right. Let me tell you why. Um, in school, the, the one of the lowest levels of intelligence that there is is called memory retention. Now, I don't know the proper order, but I know the highest level is called the spiritual intelligence. The second highest level is called uh, emotional intelligence. There's another one, but let's just go with the last level of le the high. The last level of intelligence is called the memory, mm -hmm. like the memory intelligence. Okay. So A, B, C, and D is considered memory intelligence, mm -hmm. which is the lowest level of intelligence. So A, B, C, and D, right? In school, how do you measure somebody's intelligence? A, B, C, and D. Right. And if you get the right A, you're considered what? Smart. Right. But what happens to the rest of us who are actually emotional intelligent, mm. uh, in, uh, spiritual intelligence? Mm. What happens to us? We're categorized in the box to being what? Considered what? Stupid or dumb. Right. So in school, 
I was always a DNF child. Mm. So wiring, see, I have one side of me that tells me, you're going to go succeed. You're going to go win because, you know, there's no excuses. You're born and raised in America. You have papers. You're this, you're that. You you, you have an advantage. You, you know, you didn't have to jump the border. One side of me says, yeah, you're going to go win because you're going to win. There's no other option. The other side that screws me up is thinking, well, you have these NFs. Mm. You have ADHD. You don't, you're not very smart. You don't know how to divide very well. You don't know how to spell. You don't know the difference between there, there, and there. I don't know what, <laughs> how the hell there's so many there's, but they're there, right? And two, two, and two. I'm like, what two do I use, right? So, so that category from age four years old or pre-K to kindergarten to age 17, you're spending six, 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 seven, eight hours of your day being measured by intelligence of the lowest level of intelligence. So psychologically, that makes you believe that you're not smart. Right. Because you don't have the highest level of memory retention. Right. Right? And so then another side of it says, what? You're dumb. You're dumb. You're dumb. You're dumb. You're not smart. You're in the general classes. You're a DNF student. You see uh, 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 the big fat F on your report card or on your grades every single day while the girl next to you has all her little pencils nice and organized and all structured. And she doesn't like to talk to nobody, but she's the smartest girl in the class. So she's going to achieve the highest level of success. When if you realize that your success, well, I'm pretty sure has led by your people, you the way you treat people, yep. your mannerisms, como estas, buenas tardes, buenos dias, how are you doing today? Really, that is part of what led to your success, not so much the level of intelligence that you have. Yep. Am I right? Correct. Okay. So the truth is that those A, B, and A, B students end up working for people like you and me. Yep. You know what's interesting? You know, um, I have a couple questions for you. Yeah. Um, but you know, talking about A, B, C, D's and F. So like for me, I actually, I was actually a pretty good student. Like I had A's and B's and I came across the book, Robert Kiyosaki, that said that the A students actually work for the C students. Rich dad, poor dad. Yeah. <laughs> and I was like, well, I've always been an A student. So how do I become a C student? <laughs> like, that's like the, almost the opposite of yeah. your experience. Yeah. And so, and how were your parents growing up? My parents were actually like my mom was actually like a you know pretty A student as well because again like you said four and seventeen right you kind of mold into kind of mannerisms high. is what I mean right look at my question okay mannerisms how was when your uncle walked into your house were you supposed to say hello a hundred percent what happens if you didn't I'd get a my dad would bring you to the room and say hey go say hi or you what know what happens if you didn't want to say hi to your uncles and aunts i get in trouble oh and was it just a light in trouble no 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 were your parents strict oh yeah you were forced to interact with people right that's what made your success yeah <laughs> yeah and it's it's funny though because you're right it's the people skills right the interactions the relationships that you develop the team building the culture building that's what actually builds something special yes and that's how you actually can create a movement. And I think actually Tony Robbins, I just heard yesterday say that a lot of people focus on like, how am I going to do this? How am I? But that's really not what matters. It's like, what do you want to do and why do you want to do it? And if you have enough why and you know what you want, the how will actually just develop. Yeah. So, you know, look, you know what's funny? Uh, I, I'm in life insurance. I'm in the life insurance industry. You know, I'm financial services, you know. And, it, and it's funny because my dad, when I used to go to Mexico, my parents were divorced when I was five. So I come from a broken household. And um, my dad used to take us to Mexico, Mexico, June and July. So we used to take off to Mexico. And we used to go to Mexico in December. You know what's interesting, Joel? My dad would um, sit in the car right before we took off and he did three things. One, he we were we grew up as Jehovah Witnesses. I kind of drifted away for many years, for about eleven years. So if you see me all tatted up and kind of crazy, because I molded I molded out a little bit. <laughs> I came back when I was like 29, 28. But anyways, um, my dad did three things. One, he prayed. He said, you know, he used to make a prayer. It was me and my brother Ricky. I don't know if you ever heard about Ricky. Yeah, brother. yeah, my crazy older brother. And uh, he would pray. Two, he would put all the money. And the cash he had in our socks, because in case we got jacked, you know what I mean. My mm. dad was like, "At least you guys have the money." <laughs> and then three, he used to tell me, "Mijo, if something happens to me, I have life insurance." Mm. I heard that June, um, and I heard that in December. 
um, the two, the three months that we were gone in Mexico, I used to hear that. That was the first three things my dad used to always do. So I heard that from age four or five years old mm -hmm. to all the way to age of 17. Mm -hmm. I have life insurance. I have life insurance. I have life insurance, you know, pray. Blah, blah. And so it's funny because when I was working, though, I, I, you know, after high school, bro, I was like my dad. My dad was also a terrible student. In Mexico, they put a code in your head because they said, burro. Mm. I don't know if you heard about that in Mexico. <laughs> yeah, in the schools, man, in Mexico, really? bro. If you had bad grades, yes, bro. They used to put a cone in your head because you say burro. Oh, wow. So my dad was held back multiple times. He was like 13 years old in a ninth grader class. Right? I mean, a, a little, <laughs> like with nine-year-olds. But yeah. my dad leaves school when he was like 19 years old. And he's always held back. And um, and so what's my point? Okay, my point was like, uh, you know, my dad started his business. You know, so I always knew, even though you were not book smart, you know, you're going to become a business owner. He right. said, you just always have to outwork everybody. Do you remember what happened to the economy in 2008? Yep. You remember that the whole entire market crashed? Yep. My parents lost everything. My mom got remarried. She had lost everything. My dad mm. loses everything as well. My dad takes off to Mexico, make his life. So I'm like, dude, my parents just lost their businesses. The whole market is terrible. Where do I go? So I go work in the oil field instead. Mm. So I go work for a, a company called KVS. Um, they got bought out, but you know, I go come to KVS. And then I, got, I get hired on by a company called Key Energy. And I start working the oil rigs. And I went, walked in like a little white little sheep, you know, like a little peachy little, you know, a little, little, like, like innocent, not that I was innocent, but you know, these guys are like, bro, they're hard ass workers. Yeah. You get what I'm saying? Like, yeah. you, you got these guys that are freaking, I'm, I walk in, I'm probably 19 years old, man. I used to lift a lot of weights. I'm probably like 210 pounds of muscle. I walk in, I'm six foot one. I'm thinking like, oh man, like I'm strong. Like I'm a beast. I get there, bro. And we got guys that are five foot six, five foot five with beard bellies, man. But these guys were... <laughs> stupid strong man wow. like they they literally made me look like i was a worm mm. and i would be like they would tell me pick that up in no podia bro two hands body and i just <laughs> i couldn't and they would like get that out of the way and they would insult me call me every name of the book and they would i'm so grateful for the oil rigs man joel you have no idea about i believe that brutal pain will make you somebody. Yeah. I go into these rigs, man, and these guys are freaking brutal. They call me every name in the book. Their job was to make me quit. I got broken out. If somebody who works in the oil like, oh, I don't, nobody's talking about you. You probably got broken out in the new era. I'm talking about, we call this the old school era, right? Right. In the old school era, man, their job was to make you quit because these machines, if they'll either kill you or they're going to make you disabled for the rest of your life. So they would, I remember putting my hands in certain areas, bro, and they would grab a crescent wrench and hit my knuckles and my fingers with the wrench. Oh, Boom. damn. And I would, I would get up. I'm like, I'm ready to knock these guys out. And they're like, ah, see, God. you know, they'll say a bad word. Yeah. They'll let go of the machine, and a 10,000 block pound would just slam on that exact same spot and say, oh, yeah, you want to fight me? Go ahead and put your hand there again and see what happens. Oh, wow. So their way of teaching was like, I'm going to hurt you before one of these machines hurt you. Mm. Wow. So I go into that industry, bro, and I'm there from like, I'm walking like 18, 19 years old, bro. I walk out of there. I'm 22, 23 years old. I'm now now like one of the lead guys now, and I'm a monster, bro. I, I go from being this little little punk ass kid to walking in there, bro, and being like, you know what, man? I remember these guys used to like rip my ass 24 7. I couldn't do a damn thing right without these guys ripping my ass. I can't, bro, I couldn't even look the wrong way with the ass because like these guys talking crap. And I remember like, they used to tell me, one day you're going to thank us. One day you're going to thank us. I'm like, bro, I, I, I want to kill you. What do you mean I want to thank you? <laughs> so one day my rig, I'm, I'm newer, bro. My rig shuts down and uh, they're like, and the supervisor tells me, hey, everybody's going home except for you. You're going to actually go work on another rig. I'm like, all right, whatever. I show up for that rig. I'm going to be there for two days. I get there, bro. I strap on my boots. Hey, boy, hey, and I'm working like a monster. These guys never told me I was badass. Mm. They never told me I was good. Mm. So I thought I was a worthless piece of crap that I was never going to amount to anything besides being a freaking, they call him a Derek hand in the rigs, which is the lowest position. Mm. Like, vale, es madre. Or, es lo más fácil son Derek and toda tu miserable vida. Like, oh, I'm using wow. a bunch of bad words, you know? And so I go to this other rig, bro, and these guys are like, bro, where the hell did you come from? I'm working circles around these guys. Oh, wow. And then, and they're like, and so one of the supervisors, my supervisor shows up like about an hour later, two hours later, and he tells my supervisor, like, hey, what's up with my trainee? He says, we're going to keep him. And, he said, mm. and I can hear him like, hey, you're going to stay with me, all right? And then my supervisor is like, hell no. He's like, he's going back with us. So it was funny because, like, my supervisor wanted to keep me. And he says, nah, he's mine. He's like, this guy's a beast. It's the first time in eight months that I heard that I was a beast. Mm. 
So, and I was like, man, these guys, they, I didn't realize that. I go back to my rig probably two days later and they're like, you're welcome. And I'm like, what do you mean I'm welcome? Like, <laughs> I'm like, ¿verdad que te los comiste vivos a esos vatos? And I'm like, yeah, I did. He's like, this is why we're pushing you so much. And that's when I learned mm. that I have incredible work ethic and I learned that from my dad. You don't have to be smart, but you have to have incredible work ethic. I apply that to my to my to the rigs, bro. And I and I got a position that takes two years to get. I got that in eight months. Wow, that's awesome. Yeah, but I was like the golden boy there. And, yeah, yeah. And I realized, like, dude, if I can just keep outworking these guys mm -hmm. and take the level of pain, I can succeed anywhere. Yeah. I moved up fast. I took positions that the other guys had. Man, I was just I was killing it in the rigs. Now I hated it though, Joel. Right. My dad calls me one day. I'm in Mexico. My dad's living in Mexico. Me llama. Me dice, mijo. I'm like, qué pasó, pa? He said, like. Nunca voy a entender. And I'm like, ¿qué papá? He said, Nunca voy a entender. I'm never going to understand how you're in the desert working for another man when you are six foot something. That's guapo. My dad thinks I'm handsome. That's <laughs> guapo. Con, dos, con two languages and with papers and you're working in a desert for another man in the desert. I will never understand that. I'm like, bro, I don't have baby mamas, right? I don't have no DUIs, bro. Like, I'm not a drug addict. Like, yeah. bro, you should be proud of me. I'm a super, I'm killing. Like, I have my own car, I have my own place. But according to my dad, he's like, dude, I'm so disappointed in you. Wow. And I was 22 when he called me and he told me that, bro. And, and Joel, I mean, was he right? Right. Like, think about it. Was he right? Right. <laughs> I guess it depends on who you ask. I mean, it depends on who you ask. Yeah, yeah. But for his standard and yeah. his expectation of me, right? Was he right? Right. And in his yeah, in his perspective, I would say so. He was right. Yeah. He was like, bro, you can. In other words, saying, what the hell are you doing? Right. You can accomplish a lot more. Now, I'm not throwing shade to any oil for worker, man. If if you're in this car, man, I respect you. I salute you. You're if any, if anything, the oil for workers are why I'm to my you know due to my parents as well and. My why, but they led to me manning the hell up, bro. If I had a strap throat, if I had diarrhea, if I had a, a tummy, like that's why I can't stand people who use their illnesses like, oh, I'm sick. I have a tummy cake. Oh, I'm not feeling good today. Oh, my dog is having kittens. Like all these excuses. I'm like, <laughs> I remember, bro, going to like, oh, I used to call my dispatchers. Oh, my, you know, today I have strap throat. They're like, hey, um, I can't guarantee you a job, but it, you know, guess who can? McDonald's. So if you want to get paid $26 an hour, I would suggest you show up. Mm. And then my supervisor was like, oh, I heard you're going to call out today. I was like, what? You can't handle being an oil for workers? Like, listen, you want to go flip burgers? You want to go get paid $6 an hour? Get the hell out of here then because this is only for men. Wow. So I learned that nobody gives a damn about your feelings and your, your excuses. <laughs> you see how all this was molding me to be an entrepreneur, bro? Right. You know what I'm talking about now yeah. being a business owner. Right. I just had no idea that I needed to toughen the hell up. Right. You know, and so... I'm 23 years old. I, I go, and I have back problems at this pro at this point. I go through this uh, car accident. Somebody rear-ends me, and my mm. back is no bueno, bro. You know, there was days, bro, where in my lunch break, I would I would sit down, and I couldn't get up, man. My, my coworkers would, would have to help me get up, oh, wow. and I would have to go back to work, and I would have to pick up these pipes that are 32 feet long, weigh 150 pounds over oh, my wow. shoulder, maybe 100 of them, 75 or 150 of them throughout the day in the middle of the summer. Oh, my God. You know why my back is not is giving out. You know, and this is just what I the levels of pain that I was going through, and so then I I'm 23 years old and I hear about you know uh, my mom says me I, I'm under this car accident I'm going through disability, uh, I get my car repossessed bro I'm I'm struggling and uh, I get my car back and I'm like bro I'm like I'm just going through it man you know nobody ever taught me anything about finances or money or saving or investing you know I, I don't know anything about that stuff mm -hmm. and um, I'm 23 years old and I remember that prior to my car accident when I was 19 years old I purchased a $500,000 life insurance policy mm. at my job and the reason why I purchased it was because I remember my dad was saying if something ever happens to me I have what Life insurance. Life insurance. So I knew that whenever you die, you're supposed to leave those who you love taken care of. Right. So I purchased half a million because I said, if I die, I want my mom to receive a quarter million. I want my dad to receive a quarter million. I want these guys to enjoy their life. You know, they're divorced, but I want my mom to be taken care of. I want my dad to be taken care of. So 
I'm on disability, bro. And then my mom says, Mijo, there's a company looking for people. I'm like, what is it? And she's like, it's Obamacare. Bro, we, they don't do Obamacare. I don't know why the hell my mom said that. You know? <laughs> so I showed to this office, bro. That's why it's so important to network and take opportunities, bro. Because my tia was inviting me constantly. My tia was inviting constantly go to this meeting. Mm. And I didn't want to go. I was like, nah, child is like, for what? Like, you know, I'm an old for worker. I'm stubborn, bro. I'm probably making four or five grand a month. You know, I'm 21, 22, 23 years old. Like, I drive a nice charger. I have a nice car now. You know what I mean? Like, I feel like I'm content. Yeah. I'm not happy. I hate my job, but I, I have my bills paid. And that's right. what matters, you know? And so I show up to this meeting, bro. And I'm like, my mom's like, Mijo, just go with us. And, uh, you know, a completely different person invited me to this meeting. I'm like, fine. I show up, bro. It's a small little, like, 600 square foot office. Wow. Bunch of Caucasian people, you know, the 50s and 60s. I'm all sleeved up. I went to Foothill High School. I'm from the, <laughs> I'm from the east side of Bakersfield, bro. I'm all tatted up and I'm all local. You know what I mean? I have an older brother who's, you know, who's into like low riders and, and little Rob, you know what I mean? And, yeah, yeah. And so I grew up, so I'm like, I walk in, bro, and I'm just like, what the hell? All these people are dressed nice and they're dressed professional and they talk good. And I see a guy from uh, 17 News. His name is Don Clark. So Don Clark is there, and he's the one doing the presentation. And so there's a lady from Jalisco, Guadalajara, your cousin, right? Uh, from Jalisco. Yeah. <laughs> Shows up, man, and she's like, oh, you're Alejandro. I'm like, your mom says a lot of things, good things about you. And I'm a jerk. I'm like, I'm like, listen, I'm like, Erica? She's like, yeah. I'm like, look, Erica, if you guys don't pay more than five grand a month, I'm not interested. <laughs> <laughs> and she starts to laugh. She grins. She's like, all right, Nico. I used to make a quarter million dollars a year in real estate. There's a reason why I'm here. Oh, wow. I'm like, let me just shut the hell up and pay attention. To that. <laughs> so I sit down. And you know what's crazy, bro? Yeah. Um, how, do you ever believe in the law of attraction? Yes. Do you ever believe in manifesting? Yes. Okay. So I, I saw the movie called The Secret on YouTube. Probably before YouTube. It was like a movie that I saw on a DVD player. My cousins or were the ones that introduced me to it probably like in 2000, like eight or 2007 the secret called the law of attraction i never understood it till i met erica i just always told myself like if i can meet somebody i used to go to la i used to see lamborghinis i used to see ferraris i used to see these exotic cars and i said man what the hell do these guys do are they like is that like tony hawk in there right do, <laughs> do these guys have like are they asian people with emperors in china you know like <laughs> do they work do they work for nasa are they like sk professional skaters like mm. What the hell do these guys do to afford cars that are worth more than houses? Yeah. And I said to myself, if somebody can just give me a chance, just give me one chance. Because by this point, I can prove myself that I'm a worker, bro. Like, I'm a freaking workhorse. You get what I'm saying? Like, no yeah. le tengo miedo a nada. Like, let's go. Like, let's go. Let's get to work, you know? Yeah. And I'm just like, bro, if somebody can just give me a chance. Just give me a chance, man. Just as long as they're willing to coach me and grab me by the hand and teach me. I promise you I can make it happen. I used to look at those Lamborghinis. I'm like, I bet you if that person just took me under the wing, I know I can make it happen. Yeah. I know it. At this point, I didn't think I was stupid anymore. Because mm. in the oil rigs, I had people who were Marines mm. that worked by my side. I'm sorry, but I outworked them. Mm -hmm. So I was, I was in charge. I would, I would even bully them. Mm. I had guys that were in their 40s and 50s. I'm sorry, but I would, I would bully them as well. I'm like, come on. I'm going to know like that. Like, let's go now. So at this point, what I realized is that the way you get to the top of the food chain is by work ethic. Mm. That's what I learned in the oil rigs. Mm. So I said, if these guys can just teach me, I, I guarantee you, I'll just, I'll freaking outwork anybody and I'll make it happen. Mm. I just never knew that Erica was that one person mm. and her brother Hector. Mm. And they weren't, they were successful, but in 2008, they all had, they had to restart as, as well. Right. And they were, and I, and I didn't trust them, bro. I, hell no, I didn't trust them. I was like, I didn't understand the word mentor. Or, 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 or coach or leader at the time. That was not part of my terminology. Mm. So I didn't understand that what mentors were, but I've wanted one my whole entire life. Mm. I never knew that I wanted a leader to lead me. I didn't know I, that was what I was looking for. But I, I now when I heard those terms, I'm like, oh, okay, yeah, that makes sense. I need a mentor. I need a coach. I need a leader. And so they started coaching me and they were kicking my ass, bro. Like, you know, I didn't trust Erica, bro. I didn't trust Hector. I, tr I didn't trust Hector at all. Like, mm. I can trust them as far as I can throw them, you know? And, um, but you know what? Want to know why I trusted them, bro? I trusted them, Joel, because I saw their freaking work ethic. Mm. I said, okay, okay, okay. I don't trust these guys, 
whatsoever because they come from LA. Mm. They come from the real estate background. <laughs> we know we know a lot of real estate guys are sharks, you know, especially right. and, and in town, they're not as crazy as the big cities, you know. Right. What I mean? And people think there's sharks in Bakersfield and real estate. I'm like, uh, I think you need to go to a bigger <laughs> I think you need to go to a bigger tank. You know what yeah. I mean? And no disrespect for the people in, in Bakersfield, but you know I'm pretty sure you've gone to different cities. Yeah, and you see that this is still a small town for sure. Yeah, ba I'm sorry to say it's a small town. Yep, like it's so hard to understand until you go in the network. Like I have teams in Washington and Virginia and big cities, man. You get what I'm saying? Like yeah, yeah. it's a whole different ball game. Yep. So, anyways, so I see Hector and Erica. They come from LA. I don't trust them, but I saw the way these these guys work, and I said, "Damn, I may not like them. I may not trust them." But I know for a fact that the way these guys work, they bro, they were outworking uh, everybody. And mm. I said, mm. I said, in my family, the most honorable thing we have is our principles, our beliefs of, of the Bible. But our freaking pridest thing as La Aguilares, los, los Fuentes, is that our work ethic, bro. That's always been our like our our thing. Like mm. we outwork anybody. That that was coming from my dad's side, and that was also coming from my mom's side. Mm. So I'm I'm Aguilar Fuentes. You give me and that blood type right there of hard working has been our shield of like this is why we're badass you get me yeah. so so that's always been our, our badge of honor so when i saw these guys to even outwork my family bro oh. i was like there's no way in hell these guys are not gonna make it mm. gotcha so yeah i grabbed on latched on and the same day that that erica became a millionaire because I met her when she was making zero money in our company. Oh, wow. I was by her side. I, the same day that she became a millionaire, because we have something where there's payrolls that hit her account. The same day that her she was a cash flow millionaire, it was the same day that I crossed over half a million dollars. Nice. Yeah. Congrats. Yeah, man. It was cool. It was a cool experience. That's exciting. So a couple questions, because, I mean, your dad was actually in the restaurant you know, industry. Real estate, restaurant, dealership. He oh, had, he did it at all? Well, first he saw it with the restaurant business, okay. sold it, and then uh, uh, started a dealership. And then, uh, and then uh, what's, this, what's this big guy who just, he passed away recently. What's his name? Uh, man, uh, he had a, the biggest dealership uh, here, and he passed away. Oh, really? So, uh, I don't know if you remember his name. Oh, my goodness. I can't believe I'm having a blank. But he took all the little small dealerships out of business. Oh, wow. Yeah, I forgot his name. I have to look it up. But uh, they know who they are. The family, mad respect to the family. Oh, I, got, I know uh, who you're talking about. Um, he, he passed away in Mexico, in didn't he? In Mexico, it? yeah, yeah. You heard yeah. about that. Yeah. Uh, uh, you know who they are. <laughs> yeah, I'm trying to I can't, I'm, I, I can't remember the freaking name. I can't believe it. Because <laughs> they respect. They I sh Their last name should have some respect, bro. Right. Because they came in and they took over the the used and new car industry here. Like, yeah, there's Toyota, there's BMW, you know, there's the Jim Burke Ford, there's Bill Wright Toyota. I get that, but it's, this is a Latino bro, right? That came in, man, and, and wiped out all those small dealerships out, bro. Yeah, Latino, you get what I'm saying? And uh, I forgot his last name, um, but anyways. Um, my dad sold when he, he saw that that was happening. He got into the real estate industry, mm. and they started buying houses, fixing them up, selling them, wholesaling houses, and he got into the real estate market. Did it very well as well. Oh wow! Yeah. So he he changed from different industry oh, to yeah, the other. Oh yeah. So he would just kind of just he was just an entrepreneur, and he was just all right. Where's the money at? Yeah. And kind of follow that. So that. Cool. So then for you, you found out it was in life insurance, and then you came across Erica, who you saw had a great work ethic. Same thing with Hector. Yeah. And you're like, all right, yeah, this is the first time I'm experiencing someone can probably outwork me. Yeah. So, but obviously she was not making money at no. the time. So no. besides the work ethic, was there anything else that kind of motivated you to say, you know what? Because you're making pretty good money, you know, making yeah. in the oil field. So yeah. why leave what you have? Great question. To go to this future, you're not even sure if it's going to work out. <coughs> um, look. Whenever you're making fifty, sixty, eighty thousand dollars a year, and you're twenty one, twenty two years old, and you have to clock in, clock out, you can't take a lunch break without somebody saying take it. Right. You can't decide what you get paid an hour. You don't decide what you get paid a month. You don't get decide what you get paid a week. Mm -hmm. Your lazy ass coworkers will get paid as much as you, even though you have to even pick up after their slack as well. Mm. When you, I remember one time there was a, tr a camping trip. Our family is Mexican, bro. They never go camping. You know what I mean? And like, they finally came together to go camping. And uh, 
I asked my boss for that for that week to for those three days to go uh, watch my you know my company if I cannot take those three days off. They said no, they denied them. Mm. I missed out on a camping trip that my family never took again. Wow! Because of a boss. Oh man! I remember asking for a raise. Another company, uh, they knew I had the reputation that 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 shop at KVS for being a hard ass worker, man. Mm -hmm. I was gonna pay twelve fifty an hour back then. That was back in two thousand eight, two thousand nine, mm -hmm. and uh, I asked for for a raise because I saw that I was outworking my two coworkers and and they never gave it to me. Mm. And 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 then I was just thinking to myself like, bro, if I can barely make it with myself, no kids, not married. How the hell am I going to retire my parents one day? Mm. How am I going to travel the world like my dad did with me and my brother? We didn't travel the world. We traveled all over the Mexico. But I had goals to travel all over the world. Man. Yeah. I heard about Italy. I heard it was beautiful, man. I heard Jamaica was nice. Uh, bad boys, Jamaica, man. You know, so <laughs> I was like, bro, all these places, bro. Like, like all these different places, man. Like, I wanted to go. Yeah. And then, and then I, always, I always wanted to have a beautiful wife. I always want to have a good-looking girl. Bro. Yeah. I, I don't know, bro. Maybe it's a man in me. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> I want to have a good-looking wife, bro. I wanted to have two boys. I wanted to have a daughter. I wanted to travel the world. I wanted to retire my parents. I wanted to show my dad that the sacrifice of him coming to America was worth it. Man, I'm even getting emotional thinking about it. Like, I wanted to show him, like, so I just kept on, like, yeah, we put you through a lot. Because me and my brother, we wilded out for a few years. You know what I mean? We, yeah. we did a lot of things that we shouldn't have had. And, and um, you know, I want to show him, like, you know what, dad, like, we were worth it. Like we were worth it. Yeah. We put you through a lot, but we were worth it, you know? Yeah. And, um, and I said, I can't do it at a job. I saw my supervisors, bro. And I said, I would sit there. And I would look at their life. Like, man, these guys leave one hour before I do and leave one hour after I do. Mm. I said, and they're getting paid a hundred something thousand dollars a year. And I said, these guys don't ever see their wives, man. They don't see their kids. Mm. They don't travel. They have their nice trucks. They have a decent house. Their wives are at home, bro. All day long. Mm -hmm. Some go to work and it's like, I don't want that life. Mm. I don't want that life, bro. I don't want to, I want to take my son to his first day of school, bro. Mm -hmm. I want to go out. My dad, it was weird, man. My dad used to go to, when I, I lived in Lamont, I grew up in Lamont, Laele, right? For life, not just kidding. Right? <laughs> and um, I grew up in Lamont, bro. And my dad used to come to Bakersfield and I'm sorry, to my school during recess, bro, with the soccer ball and candy. Mm -hmm. And he would give the kids candy. The teachers would let him go play, you know? So, and then my dad in a suit, bro, would take off his shirt you know, he have his, his undershirt underneath and start playing, bro, like soccer with me during school with a new soccer ball. Mm. I don't know if you remember school that soccer balls. Oh, yeah. Up, but when you had a brand new soccer ball, bro, my dad had a brand new soccer ball, would take it to us. And and he used to do that, bro. My dad in the middle, just on a Wednesday, on, a, on any day of the week, mm. randomly just show up. And I said, man, I want that. Mm. I want to take my kids to school, man. I remember my dad taking me to school, getting my clothes ready. Bro, I had to be up at 3.45 in the morning. I said, even if it wasn't the rigs, man, another job, you have to be there at 8 a.m. You have yep. to be at 7.30, bro. I said, I don't want that. Man, I want to give my kids a badass life. I didn't even I, I didn't even have kids when I was thinking this. You know what I mean? It's like, <laughs> but I knew that I wanted a better life. Right. I wanted to have a good-looking wife, man, and I wanted to so give her a good life. Like, I wanted that. Yeah. You know? And so I knew, bro, that if I didn't make a change I had already gave so many years of my life to, man, I've been working, bro, since I was a, since I was 13 years, 12, nine years old in construction. My, my dad had all these little employees, like paisanos. My dad would be in a suit and a tie, flipping houses, you know what I mean? And my dad would be in a suit and tie, and he picked me up from school. He's like, hey, más allá trabajar con mis trabajadores, you're going to go work with my employees, right? And he's, and he's like, I'm like, dad, but I have homework. He's like, you are home, and you're doing work, homework. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> my dad didn't care, bro, so then, yeah. so... I, I've worked, bro. I worked, I worked, I worked. I get, I, I'm probably 20 years old, bro, at this point. I worked in roofing all through high school. I never played sports. So, you know, I, I've worked more than the average kid, most mm. person my age. You know, like my stock was high by the time I was 21, 22. And people don't realize that you have to have a stock that what you're worth to the economy. My stock was high mm -hmm. because by the time I was already in my 20s, bro, I put in work like if I was already in my late 30s. You get nice. me? So, so. So then I'm looking at the life and I see these guys and I say, man, that's not the life I want. And then I hear, yeah, Erica wasn't making money. I didn't know that at the time. And I'm glad she, I didn't know either. But even if I did know or didn't know, it didn't matter because I saw people who were traveling to other countries, winning, you know, making over $100,000 a year by Sanos that came from Jalisco, you know, and, and I saw these guys doing it. I said, okay, Hector and Erica are not there yet, but they're going to eventually get there. Mm. Then um, when I was in the company for like six months, I go and I'm like lurking right through other companies. 
and uh, other companies that were established before us, mm. I would see, bro, these people making 500 grand in a year. I thought that was a lot of money at the time. Yeah. I was like, damn, these people, this lady over here making half a million. I saw these people making a million dollars, a quarter million, 100,000. They had these rings where you make over 100 grand and you get a ring. I'm like, man, I was like, bro, this is sick. So we're like the, we're like the Google, we're like the, the Walmart, we're like the Amazon, we're like the, the new it of these other former companies. So I said, if those guys can do it with these older uh, old school companies mm. and we're like the new it oh we definitely gonna win so mm. i said let me just stick to it bro gotcha so um question about that because you know one of the things you're saying is you know you can outwork anybody right <laughs> yeah and that's kind of what the aguilar fuentes are known for right but you know one thing that people say too is that you don't want to work hard you want to work smarter right so how when did that kind of click for you because obviously to get to five hundred thousand, you got to work smart you know what, bro? I never looked at it like you have to work hard, work smarter. I think like, see, I'm like, how to put it to you? I'm like this, this, there's a brick wall in front of me, right? Mm -hmm. And I'm like, I got to get to the other side. And so for me, it was like, okay, I can, I can bulldoze it through. Like I can go through a bulldoze. I can, I can, if it won't let me, I can go under. If I can't go under, I'll go to the side. If I can't go to the side, I'll go to the top. If I can go to the side, I'll go through it. And in my head, it was like, I don't care as long as I get the job done. So my dad did tell me you have to work because working hard is the rigs. Working hard is La Pisca. Working hard is construction. That's working hard. You're right. That right there is working harder. Working smarter, you can make a lot of money as a contractor in the fields. You can make millions. You can make millions as a contractor in construction. You can make millions anywhere you go. But... For me, I never looked at it like, oh, you have to work harder and um, work smarter, work, not work harder. No. Uh, look, bro, uh, the, realistically speaking is that 90, what is it, 98% of businesses or 99% of businesses go bankrupt the first four years? Yep. 99% to 98%. Let's call it 90%. Mm -hmm. For those who are like, well, it's, the truth is 90%. Okay, whatever the <laughs> hell, 90%. Yep. That means, bro, if you line up a million people, only 10% are going to make it, which is 100,000 of them. Yep. If you line up 100 people, only 10 of them are going to make it. Yep. If you line up 10, only one or point one is going to make it. Yep. So you're going to tell me out of those 100%, they all worked eight hours a day? Yeah, pro probably not. <laughs> Hell no. How many hours did you have to put in? Man, countless hours. Bro, think yeah. about it. Did you ever work an eight-hour day? Uh, I, don't, I still don't work an eight-hour day. Of course not. <laughs> My buddy, I don't know if you know El Camino Real Restaurant. Yeah. Okay, Alex. Yep. You know the owner? I heard about him, yeah. You need to have him in your next podcast. Okay. I'm, I'm telling you, Alex is an inspiration, bro. He is the most phenomenal human being you're going to, one of the most phenomenal human beings you're going to meet. He's a good husband. He's a good father. He's a good businessman. He's a good son. Bro, I'm telling you, like, I have, Alex, if you're watching this, man, you know how much respect I have. And by the way, his restaurant is incredible. El Camino Rad Restaurant. Right? Yeah. Okay. It's funny, he always comes like, hey, man, we started a new dish. Like, tell me what you think, right? I love it. <laughs> I'm like, I love it, bro. He comes up with all these little different ideas. But anyways, Alex comes up to me. Well, I'm eating at his restaurant. Me and my wife go on a dinner uh, date, which is so important to have a, a, a selective wife that you have to succeed as well. Yep. So I have an amazing wife. We go having a dinner, our, our date night, and we're eating at Camino. And then Alex shows up. He's like, hey, how you doing? I always order michelada, by the way. A shout out again to Camino Real Restaurant. If you like Micheladas, Negra Modelo is the one you need to go get at Camino Real Restaurant. Nice. I did like a small commercial, right? <laughs> so anyways, so I'm having a dinner night, a dinner night with my wife and then Alex shows up and then he's like, hey Alejandro, how are you doing? He met me when I was broke. And um, he's like, how are you doing? We start talking, we're chopping it up. He's telling me his routine. He says, you know, Alejandro, I just, and this isn't being genuine. It's nobody's around, just me, him, and my wife. And we're both entrepreneurs. He knows I'm successful now. He's successful. So there's no like hidden agenda. You get me? Yeah. He's like, I don't, you know what I don't understand? I was like, what? I don't understand how people can work an eight-hour day and still support them family right. and achieve their goals. Wow. I don't understand. Like, I still can't fathom the idea that they can work eight-hour days and still, like, achieve in life. He goes, I, 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 he goes, bro, I will go crazy if I work an eight-hour day. <laughs> See, <laughs> when you love what you do and you have a purpose, no se siente como trabajo. Right. Right now, it's 621. Yep. This, at what time does your office close for clients? Six o'clock. Six o'clock. What, what the hell are you doing 22 minutes? <laughs> Think about it, because it's not yeah. work. It's not work, no. 
This is not work. When you have a passion, you have goals, you don't count your hours like a normal person does. Right. An employee clocks out his time at a certain time. A visionary doesn't even think. There's a, man, I got to find it. There's this one revolution guy who would just change our, our whole dynamic of how we live life. He would have a metal ball. I don't remember this guy's name. I want to find it. And he had a metal ball in his hand. And he would have it with him because if he fell asleep, the ball would fall and would wake him up and he would grab it again. Mm. Why? Because he was so determined. Alex now has the Allstate business, has Camino Real Restaurant. Um, he started with Comprona Panaderia too. That's right there on Panama, which is delicious. Uh, really good. And by the way, they're, I can't give the secret away, but they're, they're, they're I'm going to say they're vegan donuts and nobody oh. even knows. <laughs> and I didn't know they're vegan donuts, bro. I'm over there having vegan donuts. Uh, he opened up another vegan restaurant, um, has other projects, other businesses too. And, and, and he's like, he has all these businesses. And then his dad was like, Alex, but when is enough going to be enough? He says, what do you mean? He's like, you made me like this. Mm. You made me like this. You used to get off of work and you made us work. You made us clean. You made us, you always had us going. You always had us working on the next project. He goes, it's not even about money no more. Right. It's about change. It's about your vision, your passion, your future. And, and, and people don't get it, man. They think that we work a lot. Yeah, but nobody says anything when we can take whatever days off we want because, or go on a vacation and still get paid. Nobody, nobody looks at that. Right. They're just like, oh, they trabajan mucho. They están matando. I'm like, yeah. But what you don't know is that every single morning I get to take my son to school every morning. And I'm one of the only few dads that show up to drop off his kid every morning. And I'm wiring my son. Yep. I wire my son every morning. That 10, 15 minute drive, I take him to school. I wire him. I shower my son. I get him ready. He's six years old. I went to kid. I, his first day of kindergarten, I was there. He just graduated school. I was there. I didn't have to ask nobody for permission. Yep. I took my wife to Croatia, Italy, Santorini, Athens, Olympia, Jamaica, uh, Costa Rica, Cancun, Hawaii. I took my wife all over. I took my mom all over the place. Man, if you tell me, bro, I don't even feel like I work. Yep. I don't feel it because I can work a 16-hour day and I won't feel it. Yep. I don't realize until I get home and it's late. <laughs> I'm like, oh, damn, it's 11 o'clock at night. I didn't, do I realize it? Is it tiring sometimes? Yeah, but I got things to do, man. So when people say, oh, I, I get off of work at 5, it's already late. My day's already done. I'm like, what are you talking about? You know what I always ask people whenever they want to start entrepreneurship? Like, how do I do it, bro? Right? I'm like, let me ask you a question. What time are you going to work? That's always my question. I'll go in at 9. I'm already thinking. Este way se puede levantar las 5 a.m. He can still go to the gym, get home at 6, still have a healthy, good breakfast, right? Right. And have some reading time. It's already 7 a.m. Get ready. Get ready in 45 minutes. It's 7.45. Still do whatever the hell he wants to do. If he gets off at 8, he still has 20 minutes to get to work. Yep. If he starts at 9, he has an hour and 20 minutes to get to work. <laughs> If he, if he starts at 10, oh, my God, he has a whole day in front of him already. Right. And he's like, and then they get off around 5 or 7. I'm like, what time do you wake up? Or oh, around 6, 7. I'm like, so you get home around 7. He goes like, yeah. I'm like, that's 8. What time do you go to sleep? He's like, around 11. That's 8, 9, 10, 11. You got four hours to do whatever the hell you got to do to make your life better. Yep. But people say, oh, that's the time I have to relax. I need time for myself. Yeah, you know what's going to happen? You can kick yourself in the ass when you're in your 60s and 50s and you need to accomplish the goals and dreams because you had time for yourself. And then the old the old wolf is going to be hating the young wolf. Yep. Because right now we have the energy. We have the health. We have everything right now. The resources. We have social media. We have technology. We have YouTube. We have everything. Our world is a library. We have podcasts. We have everything for us to develop and grow. Yep. 100%. There is no excuse, bro. Hundred percent, and I think that you know that just shows like the the, the the amount of time that it takes to build something special. Like you got to sacrifice today to build a better tomorrow, right? Like yeah. you said, you have the energy to do it, and you're only going to regret that down the road if you don't end up taking action. But you know, one of the things I like about you know PHP and you know you know what um, Patrick but David has done is that you know he creates entrepreneurs, right? creates people that are on w2 jobs makes them 1099 and then he has people that develop but one of the things obviously is that um i, I wonder how you answer this question is like okay well php is an mlm multi-level marketing doesn't necessarily mean it's a bad thing but it has a bad rep like what they say oh, okay it's a pyramid scheme so if someone brings that to your attention how do you how do you react to that a person who doesn't who says that can i be honest with yeah you? they're stupid <laughs> They're so stupid. Let, let me tell you why I'm going to tell you that. Okay. Okay. So let's talk about life right now. Okay. Okay. So I go to college. 
How much am I going to pay? For your tuition, average school. I mean, I don't even know nowadays. When I went to school, it cost my parents at least 30K. 30,000. Okay, right now it's probably averaging what? How old are you, bud? 28. 28. So 28. How much, uh, how much more you think college was when you went to college? It's probably the worth. Uh, it's probably like fifty thousand now. Let's just say fifty, and that's a bro. That's not even an Ivy school, right? That's not like another. That's probably going to the BC, right? Okay. So the way I look at it is like this: We start life. We graduate college. We graduate high school. Where do we go? Some people go to college. What are they getting paid when they're in college? When they're in college, probably nothing. <laughs> nothing because they're, what are they worth? Right. What are they worth? Let's talk, Jordan yeah. Peterson, what are they value to the market? Right. Minimum wage, probably. They're not value nothing. <laughs> They're not value nothing. Right, right. You're, you're valued based off what you know and what experience you have. Right. You go to college, what are you valued in the medical field? Right. What do you value as a doctor when you're in college? Right. What are you, your first year? And first, the first two years, they're screwing around, wasting their time doing general classes. Right. Right? Yep. Okay. So the first two years, they're not doing nothing. They, they think they're doing work by them doing homework. They want to know what work is? I'll take them to the rigs for a few hours and see how they like that. That's work. <laughs> okay. It's a hall pass. Then they go into two years. Then they get a degree. It's a lot of work. It's a lot of work. I'm not saying it's a lot. But bro, realistically speaking, what your mommy did, mommy and daddy did to put you through college, that's work. Not the crap that you're doing right there. Right. Right? So their value is worth hardly anything. Right. Respect to those who go to school and pay their way through it. Awesome. I see a lot of those people. Right? So look what ends up happening. They, have, they invest four years of their life. What are they getting paid those four years? Nothing. Nothing, because that was an educational training program for them. Right. But how much do they pay for the educational training program? Yeah, that their student debt, you know, usually $50,000. 40, 50, $60,000. Yep. Okay. So now let's go into what happens after they graduate college. Then they have to go get a job. Do they get paid the highest position? No. Why? Because they don't have any experience. They don't have no experience. So now they're getting paid pretty much as much as they'll get paid at Freaking in and out or getting paid at Starbucks. Right. 12, 13, maybe a, a few dollars above minimum wage. Right? Right. Then they're working there. Then after about a year or two, they kind of move up. Then they start getting paid to what? $50,000, 60000 a year. Yep. Who controls their income? Their employer. Who controls their schedule? Their employer. Who tells them when they can have a lunch, a lunch break? Their employer. Who tells them when they can take their vacation? Their employer. So if I started a business right now, and I got I invested fifty grand into the business, okay, mm -hmm. and that business doesn't pay me for four years, and when I finally business starts paying me, it tells me how much I get paid and what's my schedule. Is that a good business investment? It's a terrible investment. Oh my god, <laughs> it is. Yeah, it's it's terrible, and I, that's I think that's where people like miss right. Oh. Yeah, just to kind of piggyback off your story. Um, like for me, you know, I went the traditional route. I got my degree in bachelor's and I was like, there was a, a cap on how much money I could make. And I was like, no matter how much I grow in my career, I'm probably not going to make more than $150,000. And even though that's probably a good living, I was like, the people that have Ferraris that have, you know, the Lamborghinis, they're make, they're not, there's no way they're going to afford that. On a hundred fifty thousand dollars salary, right. because after taxes you're probably left with eighty or ninety. Yes, and so you're not really making one fifty, and it's like, okay, how can I actually achieve success? And then that's when I came across entrepreneurship and sales, where you now have unlimited potential. Did to make you get money. your ass kicked in business? Oh, one hundred percent. Okay, that's is that part of the process? One hundred percent. So look what happens in a company where, and by the way, there's a lot of companies that abuse network marketing. Right. Network marketing, that's the actual phrase. Network marketing, that means you and me have to network and we have to market our products. Right. Here, you and me are networking. But overall, what's going to bring you? It's going to bring you clients for taxes. Right. Like me, I had no idea you were in Bakersfield. I right. You're in LA. Okay. And that's a good thing, by the way, because I thought you're, you know, yeah. <laughs> it is. It's a phenomenal thing. Yeah. You have Omar Aparecio here, Rosado, freaking right. awesome freaking real estate guy. What I'm getting at, bro, is like a person joins a company like network marketing. We have to network and we have to market our products. What's going to happen off this podcast? I guarantee there's going to be a few people who say, man, I want to buy some life insurance from this guy. Yep. Right? Because I believe in life insurance. I've, I've, I sold it. I had it even before I was selling it. I truly believe in my product. That means we're networking and we're marketing. Right. 
So when somebody joins PHP, you know why I loved it, bro? Because I paid $200 to get started. <laughs> Stupid. Right. Why? Because an actual business, how much would it cost me to run a, a restaurant? <laughs> Hundreds of thousands. Okay, how much? Even a freaking taco stand, bro. Yeah, tens of thousands. Okay, how much even a hot dog stand? Still tens of thousands. You know how much I paid? <laughs> you know how much I paid for my franchise? For my contracts with the big companies? Pennies. One ninety nine, bro. <laughs> and then guess what happens? By the way, when you go graduate college, don't you also, if you want to go work at a particular job, you have to get a state license? Right. Guess what I did? I had to pay for my state license. Right. Who owns my license? I do. Right. Who owns my business? I do. Who right. owns my book of business? I do. So I paid one ninety nine. Oh man, I'm really gonna go bankrupt here, right? <laughs> okay, I start my process. You think who do you think taught me how the contracts and how to uh, and how to put a, the legal aspect of insurance, retirement planning, making sure tax accounts were good, how the four one ks work, how mutual funds, stocks and investments, how index accounts works. How who do you think taught me all that? I mean, I would imagine the training that you got from one thousand yeah. percent. How much would it cost me in school to learn account, not accounting, to learn about stocks, investments, and financial? How much would I have paid? Fifty to sixty thousand dollars. Okay, bro, and that's like a community, but financial? <laughs> I'm talking about a hundred thousand dollars. Oh, for sure, yeah. What about for, did I learn business? No, I didn't learn business. Now I have to go to school for business. Right. How much is that costing me? Double at least. Another hundred thousand. Yep. Okay. What about marketing? <laughs> Because you're in business, you have to learn right. how to market. Yeah. How much? Another double it again. Another the fifty thousand. Let's be right. honest. What about communication? Oh my goodness. Yeah, you're gonna be in debt, <laughs> bro. I learned all of this through one ninety nine, bro. <laughs> That's awesome. And I paid for my state license. And guess whose license is it? It's mine. Right. So guess who? But did I have coaches? Hector and Erica, bro, I have ADHD, bro. I take Adderall, man, right? <laughs> Don't you think Hector and Erica having a high high temper, high activity, high energy guy like me, and I, I have the memory of a goldfish. <laughs> Don't you think that they probably had a trouble to train me? Right. 1,000% were they patient. Right. Were they, of course they were. So the mentors and coaches I had, bro, Yep. When, like my brother. My brother, Ricky Aguilar, he just crossed over uh, a million dollar income. Okay. Nice. He's a millionaire now. So Ricky, um, the insurance companies are not stupid. They said, well, uh, you know, with 401ks, 403bs, mutual funds, Roth IRAs, traditional IRAs, uh, you know, pensions, all this stuff, they come through the companies. They're the ones that actually own all these accounts are the insurance companies. They insure your house, your cars, skyscrapers, all that stuff. They're not stupid, bro. Our culture we rather spend more money on quinceañeras and carnazadas and micheladas <laughs> than we do for our own future. That's a fact. They said, no, I didn't know. No, I like quinceañeras and micheladas. <laughs> All right, cool, bro. Got it. So when is your uncle and my tia? When is, when is our cousins and, and, and family? When do we talk about money in the Latino culture? Never. Never. Right. So if you talk about money, caete porque es falta respeto. Right. You talk about la muerte, uh, no, ven el cucuy. You know what I mean? That's <laughs> the sal. So we don't talk about money. High school, junior high, elementary, they don't talk about money. Right. But here we are trying to achieve success and achieve money. Right. How? It's like chasing a girl and we know nothing about her. But I love you. She's like, you don't even know me. Right. But still, I love you. That's us, Rasa, and money. Yeah. We won't get her unless we understand her. Right. Does that make sense? Yes. So a lot of people, try, everybody's trying to make money, but they don't understand money. Right. So how can you acquire or keep something you don't understand? Right. So all Rasa's over here growing, we're like rabbits, bro. Being in those paisanos and we're like 24 kids, bro, right? I got three kids. How many kids you got? <laughs> I got two. You got two. I got yeah. you beat by one, right? <laughs> How old are you again? I'm 35. 35. So I got to beat you by one. So look, just you and me already reproduce a bunch of little Mexicans, right? <laughs> so what I'm getting at, bro, is like, look at the Latino culture. It's massive. It's huge. They never call insurance companies. They right. never call these different saying, you know what? I need a freaking... Put my protect my money from the four hundred one k's. I need to insure my money. I need to have life insurance. I need to customize my son. They think this is having insurance through work is good, and it's not. It's the worst insurance you can have. Right. So they don't understand that. So guess what happens? These insurance companies who have all the money, they're like, dude, we want them reproducing rabbit Latinos. That there's a bunch of them growing. We want that market. Mm. But they're like, but we can't reach them because they think we're ice, or that we're gonna deport them, or they don't trust us because there's a culture difference and a language barrier. Mm. So the insurance companies are like, damn, how do we do it? You know what they say? 
we just, I don't want to recruit people. I don't want to train them. I don't want to get them these people licensed. I don't want to motivate them because you have to motivate right. people. You know, they don't, they don't want to do none of that crap. Right. They just want to get their products what? Sold. Right. So what do they do? They have to subcontract an agency. Mm. That's where they hire mm. people, a contract. And the contract says, don't worry, insurance companies. You know, we will recruit. We will get them licensed. We will treat the, teach them the laws, regulations. We'll teach them how to sell the products. We'll teach them how to communicate. We'll teach them how to market. We'll teach them investments. We'll teach them the financial. We'll teach them the business. We'll do all the freaking labor work, bro. We will teach them and we will sell your products for them, but you better pay us top dollar. Yep. So guess what happens? They're like, fine. So they contract us. We are the ones who go out there. Now we have to, now we have to grab somebody and recruit them, right? And we recruit them. And then all of a sudden the guy's having his dog's having kittens. All of a sudden <laughs> he he has a strap throw. You know, all of a sudden he's sick from his little tummy, inky, winky, winky. He wants to call the ambulance because there's so many problems going and you don't understand. And they give all these BS excuses, bro. Right. And then they don't fail, they fail their test. This is not for me. Then they do so what happens? We have to go through hundreds of thousands of people to find those true entrepreneurs mm. and train them wow. and get them into the business and say this is why we do what we do and if you make this happen you can help out families and you can achieve a badass life but right. how do you go find them you have to go network and recruit yep so what do we do we go and we recruit and people are like oh it's one of those pyramid things listen my brother i recruited him he makes a million dollar income you know how much the insurance companies pay me a year for recruiting my for recruiting my brother they pay me a quarter million dollars a year i get paid twenty thousand a month Wow. For just recruiting my older brother. Wow. The, and guess what? My brother doesn't pay it to me. The insurance companies do. Wow. Last year, we helped out 8,700 families. Wow. Between me and my brother's a agency. Okay? Mm -hmm. I get paid another 200 grand on the other agency I build. And then I make about $100,000 on my personal sales. Wow. Plus. Uh, yeah. I don't know about you, bro. I'm not in the game of just selling. Right. I'm not just here just being an entrepreneur, bro. I... Look, man, I've been I've been licensed for eight years and I've been making multiple six figures, seven out of eight. After you like I know every week I'm gonna get paid ten thousand to fifteen thousand to eight thousand to twenty thousand per week. you I already know it. I'm gonna grow it more, of course. But at this point, you really think that money now is my motivating factor if I already know I'm gonna make half a million dollars a year plus? Definitely not. What's my motivating factor now? You wanna know. You want to know where my, my, my adrenaline rush, where my pride, where my victory, where my excitement comes from? It's watching people win. Nice. Because now it's not just me shutting everybody up. It's also saying, look, the people you guys once doubted. Remember that DNF student? Mm -hmm. Remember all those the underdogs? I said, now these guys are winning. Mm. Where do you put the price on somebody? Have you, you, you said you have about 14. How many people you have working? 14 people. 14. Who's your, who's your top accountant or tax advisor under your team right now? Uh, I'm putting you in a very tight position. <laughs> Name me your number one most reliable guy. I would say my my two managers, my tax manager and my accounting manager. Okay. Okay. Rosie and Myra. Rosie and Myra. How would you feel if Rosie is now making half a million dollars a year and she retired her parents, traveled the world, buy her house, have her investments, and has an amazing life, and you taught her everything she knew? Super fulfilled. Bro, where's the, where do you put the price on that? Yeah, there is no price. That's price how, this. That's how I feel when I see my people win. Nice. Yeah, hundred percent. I think that um, once you get to a certain, cause you can, you only need a certain amount of money, right. To live for your lifestyle and then everything else is just gravy. So then what's going to drive you? Like for me, just like you're saying, it's seeing my team win. Yes. Right. And it's like when they get wins, I'm so proud of them, but I, you know, obviously I get a W myself, but, but my team's winning. And when my whole team's winning, it's like I'm winning but I get more fulfillment when they win as opposed to when I'm winning because they absorbed my mentorship. They absorbed my work ethic. They absorbed what I was able to teach them for just to give you an example, my tax manager, she's like, I don't do sales. I, I just do taxes. And I'm like, no, you do sales. You, you do, do sales even at home when you're trying to convince your sister where to go out to lunch or go to, that's a sale. Why can't you do the same thing for our clients? If you know that you're going to provide a good service, if you can save them twenty, thirty thousand dollars in taxes. Why are you going to be afraid to sell them a tax plan? You know, something for let's say because we normally sell tax plans where we'll save you twenty, thirty grand in taxes for four, forty eight hundred bucks. That's a five time return on your investment. Where else can you put forty eight hundred dollars and get a thirty, you know, get thirty thousand dollars back? So, but she was afraid 
to to make that sale. And so now she's one of my top sales. Yeah, top sales agent. Yeah. Of course, because it, it's knowledge that she's providing. Sell, people are, man, people have such an, uh, a terrible misunderstanding what a salesperson is. Right. Because I get it. There's pushy car salesmen. There's people that sell like Kirby's and stuff like that. You know what I mean? Like, I get it. They're very pushy and they're in your face. I get it. But then there's also the, the salesperson is also an educator. Right. Or a teacher. Right. You know, and um, by the way, before I forget, you're, by the way, you're in network marketing. Yeah, <laughs> I am. You are. Yeah. You're in network marketing. Yeah. And you didn't realize it. Like, Alejandro, how do you, it's like me calling you right now that you're in a pyramid scheme because you're in the top and you're making a lot of money. Right. <laughs> Might be stupid. No, yeah, it's, it's the truth. Because you, don't you make a little bit of, of everything that's being sold in your office? 100%. Okay. Yeah. Guess what? You're in a pyramid scheme. Right. Yeah, every business is a pyramid Isn't scheme. Isn't it stupid how, it, now, you see why I can say now it's stupid? Right. Because they don't understand business. Right. So I guarantee you that Rosie, her name was Rosie. Right. If Rosie goes and does a ton of sales, you get a small percentage of what she's selling, but she also makes a big margin. Right. Eventually, if you're not careful and you don't out hustle, she can eventually make more money than you. 100%. Right. Yeah. That's what happened to my guy. Yeah. <laughs> he makes more money than me. Right. Right. So we like only the people in the top make more money. I'm like, excuse me. So what? We just, we just got a, a, a uh, a freaking steroid shot to the top. No, we earned our position to the top. Right. So nobody was with me when I was eating Wick. <laughs> nobody was with me when we had no. We had to choose between gas money and having to buy a taco. Yeah. Nobody was with me when my when they were cutting out my electricity bill. When I didn't know where my next meal was going to be, and I'm wearing a suit trying to sell you, and I and I I don't have nothing, no money to even eat. Nobody was by my side then. When my car was getting repossessed in front of my office. Right. When I had no gas money, I was getting stuck at parking lots and I couldn't even move my car. And I was there for hours and I was embarrassed at two, three o'clock in the morning. Finally called my mom and said, mom, I'm stuck <laughs> at a gas station. I have no gas. <laughs> Nobody was there. Right. So people who say, are easy to say that. So they're not willing to put in the word. Right. Look, man, we're not selling marijuana over here. We're not selling cocaine. Are you selling cocaine? <laughs> no. I, I'm selling something that's legit good for my clients. Right. So. Going back to Rosie, she's in sales. Right. And, and why is she in sales? Because her job is to educate. Right. It's people who are in sales. Look, I'm a Jehovah Witness, and I, need, and I need to be a better one because I, you know, I'm a little wild, right? <laughs> but I'm going to tell you this. If somebody tells me God doesn't be- exist, I don't want to get into beliefs, religion, or politics. Somebody says God doesn't uh, exist. <laughs> We're going to have a very good conversation <laughs> but what's my point at the end of the conversation i have to sell them on all the facts that the bible have been proved right i have to sell them on that how great babylon was predicted to fall 400 years before it fell that even before isaac newton uh, proved that the world was actually round it was already in the bible a, a few thousand years before it, he even proved that it was round but when people thought the world was flat that i'm gonna have to sell you on the fact that the bible said that the world was actually around before they even had the technology for it Right. How they said that Alexander the Great was when he died, his kingdom wasn't be spread amongst four kings and his kids would never receive the, the legacy and his kids were going to die before they even received the legacy because they were never, that was all written 200 years before Alexander the Great was born. Yep. That was all in the Bible. These are all prophecies. So if somebody tells me God doesn't exist, I'm going to be doing what? I'm going to be selling him. Mm-hmm. And overall, if you call it selling, it's called educating. Right. What are salespeople? What are the entrepreneurs? Entrepreneurs are freaking educators, bro. Yep. We educate on why there's a demand and that they have a need. You remember, have you ever watched that movie with um, Steve Jobs? Oh, yeah. And he said, we're going to create something that they don't even know that they need. Right. You remember like really? I do, yeah, yeah. Bro, that's a freaking visionary. Yeah. Anybody who's an entrepreneur is a freaking what? Visionary. 100%. Who's an educator. Yep. With goals and dreams and aspirations. Yep. How do you cut off somebody's wings? Right. Get him an eighty thousand dollars salary, bro. That's how you cut off the wings. <laughs> so we get. Why do we get criticized? We get criticized by those who got their wings cut off, bro. And they want to sell. Like, why do you want to fly? Right. Have you seen that movie? The car. I love Disney movies. Have you seen the movie The Crocs? Yes. We're that little redheaded girl inside the cave, bro, that wants to go out there and know that there's a bigger world. And guess who's the rest of the world? The dad says, we all stay under the cave. We all live in the cave. This is what we eat. We play it safe. We stay here. That's society, bro. The society is a dad who doesn't want nobody to get out of that cave. Right. And you and me are like, hell no, man. Yeah. I know there's something out there. I know there's better food. I know there's better land. We don't have to play it safe. Right. This is only for the brave, bro. That's awesome, man. So what are you excited about going forward? Um, I, because, you know, obviously you've already created success. Yeah. You've already, you know, you're, you're getting wins by seeing your team win. So yeah. what are you looking forward to, you know, three to five years from now? Um, very interesting perspective. Um, you know, bro, there's a market crash about to take place. Yeah. 
And if you haven't heard about it because you think everything's nice and dandy, it's going to come. And I've been talking about this market crash for the last seven years. Mm. I said it's going to take this because, bro, you know, when somebody who's right now in their 20s, man, they're like, ah, what do you mean? You know, because they don't understand, but you lived it. Yep. You saw in 2008. If I'm not mistaken, you were probably about 21 when the market crashed. Yep. I was 18. And we saw the market crash. We saw it hit. And we saw what it did to our family, our parents, our uncles and aunts. And the, the excitement part about it is like, so me and my wife, we drive around these neighborhoods. And I said, well, I said, I tell my wife, I'm like, baby, just choose a house. I'm going to just choose a house. You know, I was so tempted to buy a house recently. I was so tempted. I was like, man, I want to buy one of these houses because, you know, loan rates were low and everything. Mm -hmm. But I was like, I'm not stupid. These houses are 30, 40, 50, 100,000 dollars over. Mm -hmm. it's stupid, right? And I'm just like, oh, man. I said, no, 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 no. I said, I'm going to wait till the market crashes. Mm. And then, I, and so me and my brokers, man, they're all millionaires, bro. And they're like, we're waiting, we're waiting. And then, and then you will see a lot of real estate posts, like saying, ah, look like at these idiots, like waiting until the market crash. And they'll put a bunch of memes, but the smart people were like, this is not a buyer's market right now. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the guys were like chilling. I'm chilling, bro. And I'm just like, I can't wait for the market to crash mm. because that's my wife. I said, these houses are going to go for sale and you're going to choose whatever the house you want. Nice. So what I'm looking forward to is, the market crashing, prices dropping, mm -hmm. and those who've been uh, prepared and been per setting up their their wins are gonna go and capitalize off of that. That's one bad thing I know. Yeah, but that's the true thing, bro. Like right. I, I busted my ass, man. I'm making the money. I've had my investments, and it's re it's go time. You know, that's one. Um, the second thing, bro, I'm waiting to see my, I can't, I can't wait for the, for me to get the next few guys on my team to cross over a few million dollars as well. Nice. That's another win for me, bro, that I'm just sitting there waiting. And my third one is, uh, I, I really genuinely, bro, I want to make an impact on my kid's life. I have a six year old, I have a four year old, I have a two year old. And, um, I, and we gave my, I told myself by the end of 2000, what is it, by the end of 2024, going to 2025, we're going to live in Jalisco, Mexico. Oh, wow. So we're moving to Mexico. And uh, I have my business, bro. That it, it pays me. If I quit, if I retire today and I quit today, the business will still pay me over four hundred grand. Nice. Uh, so I want to get that to you know about at least a, about seven hundred fifty to a million dollar income. Where if I walk away, it still pay me seven figures. So my my thing is like help as many people on my team win and achieve a level of success, so I can go to Mexico and run my corporations, run my company from there, and um, spend time full time just being a helping my congregation. Um, helping my brothers and my congregation, you know, uh, and just be a, more of a spiritual head household. I know other other people have other goals. I want to make 100 million, 200 million, bro. That's good. That's great. And and I wish them their success. I, I just believe, bro, that, that I want to eventually um, still be involved in my business, but not be involved full time. Mm. And um, I'm 32 years old. So by the time I'm 35, 30, 35, I'm done. Wow. Yeah, bro. And uh, and uh, still run my corporation because in insurance, you have something called book of business. Right. And when you have our type of uh, pyramid scheme that they call, <laughs> right? Imagine, bro, when you have 50 of these offices. Right. Do you still have to be running them? No. Because corren solas. Right. That's my business. Nice. So our networking business, when you walk away, it still pays you. Mm -hmm. That's the foundation. That's a franchise. Yep. So when I walk away from this franchise, I'm still going to be running it, but just with the main top guys mm -hmm. and just be at home, bro, and, and and making sure my kids progress spiritually and, and learn about more about God. I'm already, bro, if you talk to my kids, man, I'm so blessed. But, you know, last thing I want to tell this, this is outside of business, is my kids are very important to me, like any parent is. And I don't believe in whooping their ass and just saying, because I'm your dad and I said so. Mm -hmm. Example, my son, for all the parents watching this, my son, out of 10 problems that me and my wife have, when we're going back and forth, my son probably comes up with five solutions out of the 10. <laughs> Let me give you an example. I will go and I'll spank my son. Ba -ba. I'm still about the Bible, bro. The Bible says, spank your child if you love him. Right? I'll spank my kid. Ba -ba. Right? Spank him, Alexander. And he, I'm like, go to the room. He goes to the room, starts crying. Uh, right? He's crying. Yeah. Uh, uh. Then when I start hearing, <laughs> that means he's airing it out now. Mm. I'm like, okay, I'll walk in there. I'm like, come here. And, I, and I'm like, I'm like, and I'll go sit down on the bed and it comes between my legs. I'm like, okay, why did I spank you? Because, because it's not an answer. Why did I spank you? Because I went to the street. And what happens if you go to the street? A car is going to hit me. And what's going to happen if a car hits you? I'm going to bleed. And what happens if you bleed? I'm going to die. Okay. And what's going to happen when you die? Is daddy going to be happy or sad? Sad. Why am I going to be sad? Because, because it's not an answer. Because you love me. 
Okay. And what's going to happen to mommy? She's going to cry. And what's going to happen? She's going to be sad. Why? Because, because it's not an answer. Why, son? Because she loves me. So daddy and mommy spanked you. Why? Because I'll go to the street and I'm going to get hit by a car and I'm going to bleed and I'm going to die. And then you guys are going to be sad because you love me. Mm. Why do we love you? Because, because I'm like, because we love you and you're our world. So that's why I spanked you. He's like, okay. I'm like, and what happens if you go to the street? Who's going to go to the street too? Angelo, his little brother. Mm. He's like, and what happens if Angelo goes to the street? He's going to get, he's going to get hit by a car and what's going to happen? He's going to bleed him. He's going to bleed what's going to happen? He's going to die. Do you want to see your brother die? <laughs> no. <laughs> no, why? Because I love my brother. Okay. And I'm like, and what happens if I sling your little sister? She's going to go to the street. What's going to happen? She's going to get hit by a car. What's going to happen? She's going to bleed. And what's going to happen? She's going to she's gonna die. I'm like, do you love your sister? She's like, yeah. Do you want to be sad? She goes, no, that's why. She's like, okay, daddy, I'm not going to play in the street no more. See, I learned that processing. Not just saying, because I'm your dad and I said so. It's all about processing. So when me and my wife have problems down, I like, you know, sometimes me and my wife are like, hey, what about this? And like my, my wife has been trying to potty train our two-year-old. Mm -hmm. And then she, she's already potty trained, but she's like, baby, I don't think I sleep. It should have a diaper today. I'm like, hell no. She's like, why? I'm like, because today's meeting day. We have Bible study today's Wednesday. I'm like, and I don't want to be picking up piss off the carpet. Because <laughs> it's our daughter. You know that? You know, girl, yeah. kids, bro. You, how old are your kids? A two and five year old. Okay, you know yeah. exactly what I'm talking about, yeah. right? When you're potty training your kid and you don't put the diaper on, they will pee on themselves and they'll leave, you know, pee on the carpet on the ground, right? Right. You know exactly what I'm talking about. 100%. So, so then. My wife is like, no, I'm like, no, but she needs to get used to not having a diaper and maybe she has her underwear on. She's going to want to go use the restroom instead. And I'm like, babe, I don't, today's not the day. And my son's like, I have an idea. I have an idea. He's five years old, bro. I have an idea. I'm like, what is it, son? He says, what if we put on a diaper and then we put the underwear on top of it so she still thinks she has her underwear and she doesn't pee on her diaper? Mm. I'm like, I'm like, I mean, my wife look at each other. I'm like, son, you're freaking brilliant. This is a brilliant <laughs> idea, right? And I realized, bro, that the reason why is because when you process, their brain goes 10 steps ahead. Right. Versus I'm your dad and I said, so didn't we ever grow up like that? Oh, okay. yeah. Porque soy tu papá y te dije. Yep. How does that do any processing? Nothing. I want to sit there, bro, and process things with my kids through the Bible and give them spiritual and moral compass for them to make better decisions, bro. That's I awesome. want to be a full-time Christian, where well, I'm still running my business, but I can be a full time dad, so I can be there to process decisions with my kids. That's what I'm looking forward to, bro. That's awesome, man. It's uh, super exciting to see that you know you have other goals. You know, like you said, besides money, even though money is very important, family. You know, the things your kids. You know, the spirituality, your relationship with God. It's 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 a, it's a whole thing that you need to succeed, not just in business but also in life yeah so that's super exciting i mean anyone to would be honored to have you as a mentor and i think if anyone who wants to get into life insurance or even just you know spirituality anything related to you they can find you on instagram under uh, at alejandro.bfg yeah. uh would that be the best place to, yeah. to hit you instagram, up instagram facebook as well so but yeah mainly instagram that's mainly my marketing tool that i use and i'm always on it my wife as well so for all the people out there as well, whenever I receive a message, it, it goes, my wife is also connected to my Instagram. So she'll tell me like, hey, babe, Savas Kid, like you got a message if I don't pay attention or I don't see it. So it's the best place. And you know, just to wrap this up, bro, like I'm very grateful for you to have me on, Joel. Like I, I really am, bro, because um, it, it's an honor because I can look back in my life when we were struggling and we had no money, bro, and my girl was pregnant and we were literally living off of Wick to being able to like provide a good house for my wife and a beautiful life and travel the world. But the, the most rewarding feeling was well, bro, that when I'm sitting here, it's like, man, I was able to retire my father because of entrepreneurship. Nice. You know, that was probably, that was probably my biggest one, but I did that in 2016. It's 2022. Wow. You know, he bought a, he built a cabin. He, he, he lives off of that now and he makes a lot of money off of it. Jalisco and Masamigla, you know, he, he's done very well with it. Um, you know, being able to take my mom to different experiences, different countries, you know, give my kids a good life. My kids go to have traveled a lot. You know, my, my one of my biggest why is my wife. People don't realize, bro, like happy wife, happy life. And then people just take that so lightly. Right. You know, Joel, men, us hunters, 2,000 years ago, bro, we were wired to go and hunt, bro. Yeah. That was our, and women were attracted to the best hunter. People like call women gold diggers. I'm like, you're tripping. The women are not gold diggers. They're looking for a safety net. Mm. There are some girls that are gold diggers. Don't get me wrong. There's a lot of them out there too. But there's women that are looking for safety. Psychologically, women look for safety. Mm -hmm. 
and, and and providers because that's how they were wired and men were attracted to the best cooks to the best the most submissive the best daughter mm-hmm. and so people don't realize like 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 us men like I, some every entrepreneur has for a few addictions people don't realize it like like i'm a, i'm very transparent about this some people are it's pornography which they shouldn't some people is drugs cocaine some people is sex some people is adrenaline some entrepreneurs is money. Everybody, ha- every entrepreneur, like every people, every person has an addiction. Yeah. But entrepreneurs are more of a hyper focus type of people, and they have that 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 that, that go right. Right. So there's there's addictions that they deal with. Some of us have an addiction of, of saying, you know what, we like to have our, our sex, right? Like so it was like, yeah, like sex, you know, and and um and this is me being very realistic. Like mine is mainly sex. Like I like having it, right? Like any, right. any t- high testosterone male loves sex. So I know that my wife is my wife, and that's the only person I can have sex with, right? Right. So imagine when I mistreat my wife, I mistreat her, I mistreat her, and then I get home and I'm like, I make the money. Right, mm. and she gets home. She probably cooked for me. I force us. She probably is being affectionate, loving, not really. Mm. And when I want to have sex, what's her attitude towards it? She's not down. She's not as <laughs> down. She probably has a headache today, right? Or she's cramping today, right? So that takes away my joy. Mm. So for me, I realize like when I get home, bro, what do I want? I want peace because I'm when I when I step outside that door, man. I tell my wife, I'm the boss, man. I am the freaking boss. I'm the hunter. I have to get into that mindset, that shifting mindset of like, let's go win, right? Yep. So I step out that door and what's my job? I got to go hunt, bro. Because if this, if, if 2,000 years ago there was no Kmart or no Walmart, I can't just walk into the grocery store and come with a piece of meat. I had to go find my freaking food. Yep. And I couldn't come back empty-handed. That's an entrepreneur. You don't come home empty-handed. Yep. That's just the way it works, right? So I come home and as soon as I get home, I shift who has what do men love we love respect we love food we love affection and we love sex right so when i get home what's the first thing i do i get home i know that my wife that's her domain that's her system that household is her business it's her business yep it is and i'm not gonna tell her how to run her business right now i can give her advice because i'm her manager (laughs) <laughs> but she's a, she's a CEO. Right. When I walked, I can advise her like, babe, you know, but at the end of the day, that's, she's a freaking, she's a boss, man. She, she, she knows where everything is on the house. Yep. If I lose my keys, she knows where it's at. If I left a shoe somewhere, she knows where it's at. If I go to Kaiser to, for she knows my medical number. You, you get me? So yeah. when I get home, what do I want? I just want a decent house where it's not dirty. It doesn't have to be all spotless clean. Sometimes the kid's going to make a mess. You know how it is. Yep. But I, I don't want to eat out, bro. I like to eat home cooked food. You know yeah. what I mean? Like, I like, she cooks amazing. I want to eat that food. I'm not like, oh, like yesterday, bro, we were supposed to have sushi. Everything was closed. I'm like, let's go get some Taco Bell. It was a good night last night, you know? Yeah. But what I'm getting at, bro, it's like I get home and I know she's going to have a nice cooked meal. And then I get home and if she's in a bad mood, I'm like, babe, I had a lot of bad things happen today at work. I had a lot of stressful day. Mommy, I'm stressed. I'm stressed. But when I get home, I just want to come to you. And I want to enjoy you. Can we please put whatever stress you out to the side and just can we enjoy our time? You know what, baby, you're right. Okay, we, we continue. So when I get home, I like affection. I love. I like love. I like cuddles, and I love sex. So when I go upstairs, and with the kids already in bed, we already had a good dinner. We had a good time. What do you think happens? And then when she's imagine when she's sixty years old, bro. And imagine if I'm mistreating her the whole time, right? And then my ass is seventy years old, and I fall. And I and I and I gotta take a you know doo doo and I fall and I'm like help me help me babe and she's like oh now now you need my help right <laughs> Do you remember when you were beating up on me disrespect me call me worthless now you want me to take care and you wipe your ass now you're seven years old I don't think so yep I, I'm sorry bro but I realize that that's my my biggest asset in my life is my wife yep so when I'm older bro and if I take care of her and I treat her good that lady that beautiful gift that God gave me. When my kids leave the nest and they leave the house, I'm going to be stuck with her. Yep. And she's going to be taking care of me because I took care of her. So when I get to the house, uh, Joel, guess who's the boss? The wife is wife the boss. Wife is the boss, bro. <laughs> I love spending time with my wife, bro. She's my nice. best friend, man. So, you know, I'm not I'm not the perfect husband, but I will tell you, man, like, I'm, I, and she was supposed to come, man. She was supposed to come and I oh, wanted nice. her to come, but 
uh, maybe for the next time. But yeah, man, she, she for anyone who's gonna be an entrepreneur, you gotta put that whole machismo to to the side, bro. Yeah, like I'm still a provider, I'm still the man. But at the end of the day, bro, like she she's she plays the biggest role in my success, man. That's awesome, man. Yeah, I think without that, you know, support at home, I mean, there's no way you're gonna succeed in life. So I think that having that at home, coming home to someone that's gonna be your biggest cheerleader and gonna give you the, that fulfillment with, you know, sex, um, love, affection, you know, respect, all that thing is important because that just fuels you for the next day. It's like, I'm ready to go crush it. Yeah. Because you just got all your needs met at home. Yeah. That's awesome, man. So Alejandro, thank you for being on the show, man. It's been a pleasure. Thank Hopefully you, uh, we can have you on the show again. It's been a uh, you know, real blessing having you on. Okay. Thank you so much for having me on. It's a pleasure, man. Honor again. And again, we got to bring Alex to the show, man. You're going to love him. All right, cool. Absolutely.